Hold on to your seats, folks, because I'm about to take you on a wild ride to the moon. Artemis, the latest space mission, didn't take the easy route to our celestial neighbor like its predecessor, Apollo. Oh no, Artemis zigzagged and looped around the moon in a crazy, almost boomerang-like path that left everyone on the edge of their seats. One moment, Artemis was leaping in front of the moon, and the next, it was trailing behind it like a comet. But that's not even the craziest part. Can you believe that Artemis spent four times longer exploring the moon than Apollo did? That's right, four times longer! So why did Artemis take such a bizarre journey to the moon? Get ready for the answer, because it's going to blow your mind. Buckle up, because things are about to get exciting. Despite the success of the Apollo missions, no one has dared to follow in their footsteps and set foot on the moon again. But why, you ask? The answer is simple. Getting to the moon is no easy feat. It takes an incredible amount of energy and resources to achieve, and the risks are sky high, literally. That's why space exploration today is more inclined towards expeditions to Mars, where no human has ever walked before. Mars is the ultimate frontier, the final frontier. It's the ultimate challenge that all space explorers want to conquer. And let's face it, who wouldn't want to be the first person to set foot on the red planet? But let's not forget the moon. Bringing humans to the moon and back is no easy task. It's a historical feat that requires an incredible amount of energy, which is why the Saturn V rocket is still revered as a legendary rocket. But guess what? The Artemis rocket, the SLS, is advertised to be even stronger than the Saturn V. So why, you ask, did the Artemis I mission have to take such a bizarre route to the moon? Well, my friend, it all comes down to one of the most fundamental concepts in physics, delta V, or the change in velocity. When planning a mission to the moon, it's essential to know exactly how much the spacecraft needs to change its velocity to complete the journey. The delta V for a specific route is the same for every rocket. Two completely different spacecraft traveling on the same route will require the same delta V. There is just one massive difference. How much power does a spacecraft need to generate to attain this delta V? At launch, Apollo missions generated almost 13,000 feet per second, or 4,000 meters per second in terms of delta V and every bit of this change in velocity requires tons of propellant. Have you ever wondered why the weight of a rocket matters so much? Well, let me tell you, it can make all the difference when it comes to space exploration. If a rocket is too heavy, it can cause a massive increase in fuel usage, which means it will cost you millions if not billions of dollars. And if the engine isn't as efficient as it could be, well, you might as well kiss your space dreams goodbye. It's like a game of balancing act, trying to find the perfect combination of weight, fuel, and efficiency to achieve the desired outcome. Did you know that the Artemis missions use a lighter module than the Apollo missions, but with less than half of the Delta V? That's because the Artemis I mission prioritized the comfort of its onboard astronauts by using a larger command module at the expense of its service module. In contrast, Apollo used a smaller command module with a more powerful and reliable service module with a thrust of 91 kilonewtons compared to Orion's 26 kilonewtons. And that's not all. Apollo's service module also had a larger propellant capacity. These factors massively affected each module's delta V. For the Apollo missions, sacrificing the command module would mean that life support on the space module was limited and systems could only support the onboard crew for a mere two weeks. This was the reason why the Apollo missions took a more direct and faster route to the moon and back to Earth. As soon as it came close to the moon, it performed a long duration burn that enabled Apollo to get to the moon in just three days compared to the 10 days for the Artemis I mission. The incredible mission to get the Orion spacecraft, which is a partially reusable spacecraft used in NASA's Artemis program to the moon, involved a daring technique that allowed it to orbit the moon for an extended period. They achieved this by using a distant retrograde orbit, flying in the opposite direction of the moon's orbit while still orbiting at a distance. But the real magic happened when they managed to maintain this orbit without burning through precious fuel. How, you ask? by expertly balancing the spacecraft's time at Lagrange points 1 and 2 
which eliminated the need to expend any fuel. Orion took a unique path to the distant retrograde orbit to conserve as much fuel as possible. Instead of targeting a point 43,500 miles or 70,000 kilometers away from the moon, it aimed for a point just 62 miles or 100 kilometers above the lunar surface using a gravity assist to slow down. And guess what? Contrary to popular belief, gravity assists can be used to decelerate an object by approaching the moon from a different angle. With this approach, Orion was able to slow down enough to enter an elliptical orbit with an apopsis of 43,500 miles or 70,000 kilometers. But that was not all. Orion had to perform another burn to circularize its orbit and reach the distant retrograde orbit. By executing a burn at its apopsis, the spacecraft accelerated and raised its periopsis to 43,500 miles or 70,000 kilometers. This allowed Orion to travel deeper into space than the Apollo missions and spend more time testing its systems. Orion took 12 days to complete a single orbit around the moon, and because of an advanced and larger command module, NASA could have the option to extend the mission for 12 more days, giving them an extended period to test the capabilities of the spacecraft and get the data they need from the moon. What's more interesting about this bizarre route of the Orion is that if you take away the moon and record the trajectory of the spacecraft, you will notice that it is still following our planet, just in an elliptical orbit. Because its orbital period was the same as the moon's, it appears that it always swaps sides with the moon. But going to the moon was just half of the mission. The Orion still needed to get back to Earth. In order to get back to the Earth, it had to break free from the moon's gravity by performing a genius gravity assist maneuver in reverse. Just like the gravity assist that we know, Orion used the gravity on the moon to slingshot it back to our planet. The spacecraft slowed down, approached the lunar surface, and did a final burn to launch itself back towards Earth, taking advantage of the so-called Oberth effect. But what exactly is this Oberth effect? Here's how it works. When a rocket is moving at high speed, the kinetic energy of the rocket is much greater than its potential energy. This means that when the rocket burns fuel to increase its speed, the energy gained is much greater than when it's moving at a slower speed. This is because the rocket's kinetic energy increases exponentially with its speed. Think of it this way. Say you're on a moving walkway. The slower the walkway is moving, the slower you will get to the other side. But when the walkway is faster, your velocity will also be faster, allowing you to reach the other side much faster. Plus, you can achieve a higher delta V because you spent less time walking. That's what the Artemis did when it went back to Earth. At its closest approach to the moon, it experienced the highest amount of gravitational pull, which sped the spacecraft up, like in the faster walkway. This is why the Oberth effect is such a big deal in astronautics. It's one of the fundamental principles that makes space travel possible, and it's used in almost every space mission that has ever been launched.